Hello everyone, my name is Akal and I am a somatic therapist. If you'd like to find out, well, somatic counselor as well. I'm adding all sorts of like uh, nomenclature to uh, my duties. Uh, if you'd like to find out a little bit more about the work I do, you can check out my website down below this video. So today we're doing Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter, you know, Jupiter is kind of like, I, I don't know, it, I'm not going to say it's boring, but it's very clear cut to me. It's very clear cut because it speaks in a lot of ways to uh, the process of maturity. Uh, Jupiter to me is a late maturing uh, kind of planet. Uh, Jupiter is something that everyone looks at someone's chart and goes, yay, they get all excited. Venus and Jupiter because they're benefic placements. Uh, Jupiter is something that will bring you prosperity, wealth, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So now the thing is, is when we're talking about Jupiter and we're talking about prosperity, wealth, et cetera, what we're kind of looking at here is as it prosperity, wealth, material plane attainment, uh, as it relates to spirituality. Uh, that's Jupiter's ultimate goal, uh, is that spiritual process. So let's look at the sort of fundamental basics of how Jupiter functions first, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the sort of this progression that occurs with Jupiter. So the gunas, or the fundamental energies associated with Jupiter, are rajasic energy and sattvic energy. It's rajasic energy as its kind of deeper vibe. And this deeper vibe means that it's, it's about activity. Uh, it's about attaching. So Jupiter is not interested in separating itself from material plane, from wealth, etc. It's not disinterested in material cultivation is what I'm saying. So uh, the reason I, I say this is that rajasic as a force in nature, as a force in, in all creation, uh, what it does is it, it moves towards things and attaches. So that being said about that being a fundamental underlining energy, uh, rajasic energy is very proactive and sometimes it's on autopilot. So meaning that this implies to me um, kind of action from birth to death that simply just happens on a deep level. So now on a secondary level or the level in which we uh, can more relate to with Jupiter uh, is sophic, meaning harmony, balance, and discernment. I like to think of the word discernment when it comes to sophic, particularly when we're talking about Jupiter. Uh, so this activity that moves into discernment. So what this means is that somebody's choices that they're making throughout the course of their life. And again, Jupiter wants us to be prosperous. Jupiter wants us to thrive. Jupiter wants all sorts of grand ambition for us because it, Jupiter as a fundamental force is expansion. Uh, so with Jupiter, what you end up getting is we ex begin, the expansion process begins when somebody discovers, let's say, religion. Um, so I'm looking at these progressions here. So we got material to spiritual, and we got religion to spiritual. Now, uh, it doesn't mean that religion is inherently devoid of spirituality. Of course, it's spiritual. Uh, however, the aspects of religion that we take uh, early on in Jupiter's progression through life, those, those aspects that we take on and that we um, understand are very exoteric. Um, again, I, I think about even my own progression. I was raised Catholic. Uh, Catholicism didn't do much for me, uh, so I became kind of atheist. Uh, then atheism didn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense either because I, I saw something very significant. And I started, you know, what I saw in life was the interconnective, the interconnectivity of everything. I had these visions and these moments in my 20s that sort of woke me up and said, oh, there's much more going on here. And I like to think that that was kind of like Jupiter coming along and, and kind of saying, hey, there's more. Because that's what Jupiter does. Jupiter says, hey, there's more. Uh, Yogi Bhajan has a wonderful quote. Um, he said, if you can't see God in all, you cannot see God at all. And that's Jupiter's function, is to get you to see God in all. But again, 
how it functions, it's very different. I mean, Saturn, in a lot of ways, wants to do that as well. Saturn wants you to see the God in all, but Saturn is, now I'm going to get to the Saturn in my next video, but Saturn uh, is a contracting force. It denies you material prosperity. So that's where Jupiter, Jupiter is interesting because uh, when I st was studying Kundalini yoga, uh, you know, in Kundalini, when we're talking about Kundalini, and I, I think Kundalini, the word itself is relevant to Jupiter as well. What we're talking about here is, is a deep vibe. It's a deep vibe that, that, that we all kind of feel and sense within ourselves. I remember when I was very young, I kept thinking like there's more. I kept feeling like there's more to, to my existence and I wasn't sure what it was. And I knew there were latent abilities um, that I had that were kind of untouchable in some ways. And so Jupiter speaks a lot about latency it speaks a lot about what we discover as we're moving along our spiritual progression or along our path. Uh, but again, the beauty of Jupiter is that you don't have to deny anything. You can achieve. So Kundalini Yoga, what I was trained in, is a householder's path. And it basically, to me, is kind of the Jupiter path as opposed to, let's say, me moving to a monastery and, and cutting away all my worldly connections. So it's not the ascetic path. It is the householder's path. So meaning that I can actually find spirit in my everyday life without denying myself those comforts that, you know, basically assist me along my process. So, uh, but again, Jupiter is also interesting because it's not interested in your liberation. It's not interested in your, your uh, movement towards nirvana. Again, what it's here to do is to expand your awareness through philosophy, through religion, through spirituality, through yoga, through tantra, through all these different um, ways in which I, I guess we end up accessing deeper latent aspects of ourselves. In these deeper, deeper latent aspects of ourselves, I like to kind of like uh, associate Jupiter with, let's say, clairvoyance, clairaudience, and all sorts of woo-woo. And the reason I like to make that association again is there's a story that I read somewhere and I don't remember, so I'll get the details all mixed up maybe. So I'm not going to go into the details, but they talk about this chariot that carries Brahaspati. Brahaspati is Jupiter. It's the, the Vedic word for, for Jupiter, basically. Uh, but this chariot that's pulling him along is pulled along, I believe, by eight pale horses. Now, the reason that they're pale horses is because it's, they're representative of, again, latency. They're representative of, of that which we're kind of not aware of. So now what's interesting, again, reflecting on my own path, is that at a very early age, I, I knew that there was more. My intuition was uncultivated. So I went into all these spiritual practices. I went into meditation and yoga and all these different things, and I started to have experiences and things that opened me up and I felt broader and more expansive and, and richer. So the function of Jupiter, like I said, it, I said ad nauseum already, which is this expansive quality. Uh, I wanna use look, look at the word exoteric versus esoteric. Uh, that's like a, it's something that I didn't understand for a very long time. So exoteric would be that which is on the surface. And again, this is early Jupiter. Late Jupiter is esoteric, meaning there's, there's a progression of turning inward. Uh, and I don't mean this, this progression of turning inward. Uh, I've heard psychologists and people like that talk about this collapse of our consciousness. Sometimes a collapse of consciousness happens when there's trauma, meaning our awareness basically collapses in and we shell up. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is essentially meditation. So the more we meditate, the more we start to understand those aspects of ourselves which are hidden. We start to, there's, there's a revealing of our, um, I, guess, I guess a revealing of our beliefs. There's a revealing of those things which we hold on to in terms of, like I said, not only belief systems, but uh, our attachments. And again, Jupiter's not really trying to uh, liberate us from the attachments, it's simply here to show us that the attachments aren't what matters. So Jupiter is also this kind of progression from selfish 
to selfless. It's humanitarian in nature. It's about service to humanity. Uh, but oftentimes, like I said, what happens again early on is that we attain these material things. Jupiter really helps in sort of becoming very prosperous so that we can then serve humanity. Uh, I, this is very idealistic for me. Um, I would absolutely love to be able to become very, very, very wealthy so I can then donate a bunch of money and do a lot of good deeds and services, et cetera. But my path is a little bit more Saturnian. Uh, so this idea of this transformation into the esoteric. Now, the esoteric is, you know, that, that's the occulted things in life. The occulted just means it's covered up. We don't see it. It's not there. So um, this process of meditation will reveal these occulted aspects of not only ourselves but of the universe around us. And once we realize those occulted things, like I said, we start to see the God in all that Yogi Bhajan was once talking about. So something else I want to talk about is this knowledge versus wisdom. So Jupiter governs information in a lot of ways. Uh, I don't mean like the sort of like mundane information. That's Mercury in a lot, you know, so you want to look at third house, Mercury, that's where you sort of get more kind of mundane information. Uh, with Jupiter, though, what we're looking at is it's, it's about the sort of more expansive information. It's about the movement into philosophy, let's say. Um, you know, again, high mindedness. That's another way I kind of describe like Jupiter energy. Uh, however, knowledge in and of itself is superficial. And again, I'll reflect on my own life. Early on in life, I had lots and lots and lots of knowledge, very little wisdom. Now, the difference between knowledge and wisdom is only one thing, and that's experience. Uh, so knowledge plus experience equals wisdom. That's my formula. Uh, so again, we can see all this transformational process that occurs with Jupiter. Uh, and again, Jupiter is so great because Jupiter doesn't hurt. <laughs> oh, except one thing. Now, where Jupiter kind of gets you has to do with your dogma, your beliefs. So dogma, beliefs, or alienation. Uh, and the reason I'm saying this is if you look at what Jupiter governs, Jupiter governs uh, Sagittarius. Um, I'm thinking in more contemporary terms. He, historically, Jupiter also governed Pisces, but uh, as I perceive it at this moment, I'm just gonna say Sagittarius. So Sagittarius, uh, the ninth house, those energies often lead to a kind of alienation. Uh, they can lead to a brand of kind of arrogance. So you might see an arrogance because somebody is in love with their knowledge. Uh, they lack experience. When they have that experience that comes along, they start to see that there are many paths toward the same outcome, towards the same goal. So the realization that there are many paths towards the same goal Usually, like I said, it has to occur in some way. Uh, and, I, and I think that way with Jupiter and anyone who has a lot of Jupiter energy and anyone who tends to hold on to their beliefs very tightly, that happens through argument, disagreements. So the arguments and the disagreements that end up happening with Jupiter, they're here to shake us out of our, our, you know, our BS you know, our, our sort of belief like, no, this is it, that this is the only way it is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have a lot of strong Jupiter energy in my chart, so I know all about dogma. I get, <laughs> I get very, very stuck on my beliefs. Um, and so I tend to attract in life a lot of forces that will shake that belief. A lot of people who will argue with me and call me out. I call them razzers. You know, these people that will razz and poke me until I have, well, basically until I relent and say, hey, you know, I can realize that, you know, you're right as well. There's a lot of correct in the world. There's a lot of incorrect in the world too, but what Jupiter's trying to get you to see is that there's a lot of correct. There's a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of agreement to be had. Uh, Jupiter doesn't want conflict. And like, so, so when these, so when the conflict occurs due to a fixed belief, you know, Jupiter will allow you to expand beyond your belief so that you can then accept that other person's belief. Or if you're reading a book, the beliefs within that book, et cetera, et cetera. So Jupiter energy in summation 
rajasic and tasatvic. We are talking about activity into discernment. And one, one final way to look at sophic energy is that it can see this and that. It can see the polarity. And when you can see the polarity, you can then make a choice. And so Jupiter wants us to move along our path authentically. And authentic movement along our spiritual path means that we're going to move towards those things that feel right. So Jupiter in a lot of ways reflects intuition on some level. Uh, it's not the visceral, the, I guess the visceral um, intuition that maybe say Venus represents. It's kind of a knowing. So the intuition that Jupiter, in my opinion, represents is just sort of a knowing. And that sort of a knowing that comes along with this sophic expression means that we can see this or that and we can choose based on, eh, I know that feels better to me. So you simply go towards that. So with all that said, I'm gonna go ahead and show you how I connected Jupiter with Yogi Bhajan's Aspect 8, or the leader from Yogi Bhajan's book, The Mind. All right, here is Yogi Bhajan's book, The Mind. In the back of this book is a chart my chart is in really bad shape. So here we have the chart of the universal mind, the three fundamental energies or the gunas, tamas, rajas, sattva. And so again, Jupiter begins at rajasic, or again, it says energy which binds, contains, attaches, identifies, and categorizes. So we follow that line down to the neutral mind. The neutral mind, once again, is discerning. And then we have the leader, or aspect eight. Now, what we do is we go ahead and flip through the book, and we find aspect eight. Sorry, more flipping I'd like to do. Uh, here we go. So aspect eight, the leader. And here's a little blah, blah, blah. And the exercise. And so this exercise is suggests we're doing for 31 minutes. Uh, and in the next segment, I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to do this exercise. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to do the meditation that is associated with Jupiter. Uh, in this case, it is Aspect 8, The Leader, from Yogi Bhajan's book, The Mind. Uh, so this mantra has, has basically, well, it has some very interesting words. It's meant to be done very monotone. So this is not a sing-songy kind of mantra. This is very monotone, and you want to be very precise with your projection. Um, something else that's really important about this is that you and I, this is going to be cryptic perhaps for some of you, but this idea of speaking from the navel. So again, this is about the leader. So a leader, I remember hearing Yogi Bhajan talk about this before, where he says, if you're not speaking from the navel, no one will trust you. And the reason I, I would say that is, has a lot to do with, well, one, the force behind your words, uh, two, are your words grounded? Are they real? Are they free of illusion? Um, and also, I always found that to speak from my navel, when I'm speaking from my navel, it's, it's, it's sort of like I'm simply flowing. I'm not analyzing my thought process. I'm not self-conscious. So again, this, this idea of speaking from the navel, for me, I, I usually, what I have to do in order to learn to come from that place is usually when I'm inhaling, I'll bring my awareness down to my navel, and then I'll usually start to do the mantra. But it's usually, again, it's about bringing some degree of focus to my belly, to the belly area, and then speaking from that place. So again, this is monotone, and it's meant to be spoken from the navel, because that gives you strength and authority. But also the other thing about speaking from the navel is that it's, it's a statement about where your center of gravity is. The center of gravity should not be here. 
uh, in our culture, we are conditioned to function from the third eye point. Well, not from the third eye, but from the sort of place where the ego rests, uh, from the intellect, from, from the mind. Uh, and so what we see in our culture is a lot of neck forward kind of postures, a lot of rounded postures. Um, this protects the heart, but it also we end up leading with our head. So our true center of gravity, our center of mass, is two to three fingers below the actual navel itself, so approximately the belt line. So with all that said, uh, this mantra, I'm going to go ahead and my pronunciations may be a little bit off. Uh, I, have, I went through yoga teacher training 15, 20 years ago, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's fairly accurate. The good thing about the language that Kundalini Yoga, well, Sanskrit or Gramukhi or whatever the name of the language is, I think it's Gramukhi, uh, is that it's phonetic. As it looks is how it sounds. So the, I'm going to put the mantra on the bottom of the screen so you can see it. Uh, and again, each, each word you want to do, you want to, you want to basically say it and project it uh, very intentionally. So the first word is ades. And then it's, uh, this is a different one, it says to say, T-I-S-A-I, ades, to say, ades. Then it's odd, anil, anod, anot, juga, juga, eco vase. So it's a des to say, a des, odd, anil, anod, anot, juga, juga, eco vase. It kind of actually has a nice kind of rhythm to it once you get into it, um, which I think is another reason why Yogi Bhajan chose this this particular mantra to go with what we're going to be doing with our arms. Now, this is the painful part, folks. Um, a big part of expansion of, again, Brahaspati, Jupiter's expansion energy. It's about pulling the energy up to our most expansive field, which is the heart. The heart field is our expansion. And also, when we're in our heart, we're not in self-conscious. We're not, you know, going back and forth between this and that constantly. We're not vacillating on something in our in our head, you know. Again, it's 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 a place of presence. So, this motion, I'll go ahead and show you what it looks like from the side. Uh, essentially, what we're doing, so palms are down. So the motion is, with each one of the words, we're going to be going up and down. So it's from, I guess, uh, horizontal to 60 degrees. So level to 60 degrees, level to 60 degrees. So it kind of looks like this. Ades to say, ades. Odd, anil, anod, anot, juga juga, eco ves. Ades to say, ades. Odd, anil, anod, anot, juga juga, eco ves and on and on and on. And it, it can get, you know, get very tiring because the instructions are very specific about you not letting your elbows bend. You wanna keep that nice, straight, rigid arms. So uh, the other thing is there's no breath pattern prescribed here. Uh, so basically just allow the breath to happen as it normally would. Uh, the other thing is that there's no dristi or eye position prescribed. So my suggestion is to look at the tip of the nose or to close your eyes and bring your awareness to the brow point. To kind of roll your eyes up a little bit. It's as if you're looking at this space inside your head. So with all that said, I, I think that's all I want to cover on this. Uh, well, one, one other thing. I do highly suggest that while you're doing this exercise, this will help kind of, this will help with the projection from the navel point, is to slightly lift up your pelvic floor while doing this. And what that's going to do is, so if you lift up your pelvic floor, meaning the perineum, which is the space between the anus and the genitals, if you can lift that up very, very gently and maintain it throughout the duration of this meditation, one, is it helps pressurize the energy upward 
And then two, it also will create a slight contraction at your navel point. And once again, around the belt line, allowing you to enunciate from that space and that place. One final thing, uh, the duration of time for this, this particular exercise is, it says 31 minutes. Uh, you wanna start off, be realistic with yourself. Um, start off with three minutes, go to 11 minutes, and, and then progress to 31 minutes. And one other thing is that in order to get, reap the full benefits of any, any practice, particularly something that's gonna stimulate the nervous system in a strong way, think about 40 days. That's the amount of time it takes for your nervous system to take on a new pattern. Uh, so, all that being said, after you're done with this meditation, I suggest meditating for, you know, with open awareness and total surrender and total acceptance for at least five minutes. So thank you much. I appreciate you watching this video.